can name that song? Yes, yes, you got it. Day of Resurrection, lead on, O King Eternal, it's all there. Do you realize we get to worship the Lord tonight? Do you realize that? Yes, we get to worship the Lord tonight. We get to be here together. There's nothing like this on, in all the earth. They're not worshiping the Lord in the Milky Way galaxy. They're not worshiping the Lord in the depths of the earth. We get to worship God. You get to be here tonight and praise the great and mighty name of God. You want to pass on to your children and great-grandchildren that there's nothing else in this life like the freedom and the privilege to worship the Lord. And if our freedom to worship the Lord is ever taken away, we will meet in homes and we will find other places to gather together, but we will not stop worshiping our great God. And it's great to see you tonight, a little overcast Sunday, but guess what? Behind the clouds, the Lord and his son are still shining, and we praise him for that. I want to call us to worship from a passage of scripture tonight because we are concluding a central piece of the book of Revelation, and that's chapter 3. And the seventh church, which we're going to learn about tonight, is the church of Laodicea. And you've probably heard of Laodicea at some point in your lifetime. And of all the seven churches, they were the worst. And they were the worst because they were what Jesus calls lukewarm. And Jesus says that believers in churches that are lukewarm, I want to spit out of my mouth. And I want to give you a thought about how to prevent yourself from becoming a lukewarm Christian from Philippians chapter 3 and the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was nothing to look like, look at. He had a hunched back. He had eye problems. He couldn't speak well. He wasn't eloquent, but he was so full of the Holy Spirit, people could not deny him. Stephen, before he was killed and went to heaven, was observed to have the face of an angel shining back at the people. And so it's not about your stature, your size, what you look like, how much money you have, what you wear, nothing. It has to do with the Holy Spirit filling you. And Paul says in Philippians 3, these incredible words, listen, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have, for his sake, suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead and now this not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Well, here you have before you a man who had done so much for the Lord and accomplished so much for Christ and his kingdom, but he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't smug as the Laodicean Christians were. He wanted to press on for Christ until his dying day, and whatever he lost in the process, he counted it as gain. Because his eye was on the prize. His eye was on the goal. And so tonight we're going to look at how we can fight against lukewarm 
churches and lukewarm Christianity because we don't want to be spit out of the mouth of Jesus. And so, would you rise and we'll sing together. Come Christians, join to sing. And we're marching when we're pressing on to Zion together. Let's worship God.
gracious Father, our hearts are panning. We're out of breath with love and adoration of your great and holy name. To sing your praises in the company of your people. To know that the angels of glory observe our witness. And to know most of all that you receive our praises through Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, it's more than we can endure. It is a foretaste. It is a pleasing sweetness to worship you, to let our soul soar heavenward in the name of Jesus Christ by the powerful agency of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, come and smile upon our congregation. Teach us, instruct us, lead us, and guide us. Be our faithful and true witness here in the house of God tonight. Thank you for gathering us together whatever state or mood our soul and heart may be in. May your spirit minister what is appropriate to our need this night. In your name we pray, amen. Let's greet one another in Jesus' name. been singing He the Pearly Gates Will Open several times over the last number of years. We've sang it first at our father's funeral. It was his one of his favorite songs. And uh, so we've done it a number of times over the years since then, and you folks keep asking for it to come back again. So we're here again. And uh, we enjoy singing together. I was just thinking while we were singing down there that what a blessing it is for us to get to sing together. And uh, someday we won't be able to do that. But until we get to the pearly gates, then we'll yeah. sing together again. But while we can sing together, we're going to sing together. So listen to He the Pearly Gates Will Open. So great and wondrous, deep and mighty, pure sublime, coming from the heart of Jesus, just the same through tests of time. Thank you so much, Glenn and Ken, 
for ministering to the Lord, to us, to our hearts, to your own souls, memories of your dad's uh, memorial service and all that goes with that. And we're looking forward to your concert when you're all ready for it too. <laughs> Let's pray together. No, Heidelberg. Let's look at the catechism. Some good stuff here. 46 through 49. What do you mean by saying he ascended into heaven? But isn't Christ with us until the end of the world as he promised us? If his humanity is not present wherever his divinity is, then aren't the two natures of Christ separated from each other? Before we go on, what, what, you, what we just read is such a beautiful statement of the divinity and humanity of Jesus, how he can be seated in his glorified humanity and yet with us personally until the end of the age. That's one of the, the, the classic writings on how the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ um, are what they are to God's people. Finally, how does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? It's a beautiful thought to know that the, that the humanity of Jesus now in heaven is the guarantee of our future spiritual body in heaven as well. It's just overwhelming. So let's pray together. Our Lord and our Savior, we, we never grow weary of learning not only about you, but from you. We thank you so much, Jesus, that through your spirit you teach us. We, we bless you tonight that you are God and man. And how we wish the whole world would worship you as the God-man, would adore you, and seek to honor you. But we know there are countless human beings across the earth who do not worship you. And that breaks our heart. But we praise you that the gospel is going forth throughout all the nations and continents of the earth. We praise you that on this Lord's Day, radio preachers were able to reach people across time zones and across national boundaries. We thank you O oh Lord, that preachers across the earth in large gatherings, in small hiding places, told people about Christ. We thank you that today countless millions of children were brought to congregations around the world so those children can 
firmly grasp the baton of faith and follow the way of Jesus. Lord, we don't know how long this Lord's Day cycle on earth will continue. We praise you that once every seven days we can gather and worship you. Oh, how we need to be together. And this is what the Bible teaches. Do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And so we come together, Lord, because we are your body. You are our flesh. We come together, Lord, because we are your bride and you are our groom. We come together to encourage each other in the things of the evangelical gospel and faith so that we stay true to you, so that we stay true to the Bible teachings. We praise you, O oh God, tonight that we can hear your word, we can sing songs of faith and leave here refueled by your spirit for another week of service to you. We pray for those who are hurting, whether it be physical pain or emotional pain or family pain. We pray, Jesus, that you would renew their hope, that you would comfort them, that you would stand alongside them and be their guide. The journey to heaven is a difficult one, though salvation is by grace through faith in you. Sanctification is challenging. First, we have to repent of our sin in order to trust in you and come to saving faith. And then the life of faith involves that same repentance and that same ongoing struggle to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. But then we face the trials of life, the disappointments, the heartaches. And we throw our hands up and say, how come, oh God? Why? Why, oh Lord? And Lord, when we ask that question, we know that we are in very good company. David asked you why. Moses asked you why. Abraham asked you why. Jeremiah asked you why. Habakkuk asked you why. And on and on it goes. And finally, Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why? This age, Lord, is full of snares and pits, quicksand, devils, and traps, and harm, and injury. It feels sometimes like we have a bullseye in our soul, and the evil one keeps striking at us. But Jesus, we thank you that he struck you before he strikes us. And we thank you that one day, as Paul writes in Romans 16, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under his feet. The serpent's head and entire body will be killed. As a friend of mine sometimes say, I just want to punch him in the face. We pray, O oh God, for the war, for the end of it, for the relief that so many people are looking for. We pray that through this, this disaster, O oh God, the gospel would shine forth in the rubble of buildings and in the rubble of torn families who've lost loved ones, in the rubble of a war. May the resurrection of Jesus Christ rise up and may people look to you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and pray tonight for this country. We're not going to stop praying for revival. We're not going to stop praying for thousands and thousands, tens of millions of people to come alive in Christ and flood the sanctuaries and storefronts and chapel services and prison Bible studies around this country. We're praying for a third great awakening. We're praying for a moment of reprieve from the darkness. 
We're praying for massive numbers of people to repent of their sin. That you would send the Spirit into Hollywood, in Bollywood. That you would send your Holy Spirit of Jesus into newsrooms and into political headquarters at local, state, and national levels. We pray that you would send the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ into the United States Congress, the House of Representatives, all three branches, judicial, legislative, and executive. Pour out your spirit upon these men and women, God. Look, many of them need Christ and they reject him. Others have Christ and need strength to hold true to you and to the truth as you design this universe and world. We pray, O oh God, that all that we do and say would be done in love that we would speak the truth in love, that we would call people to repent in love. We pray, O oh Jesus, that people would get ready because we can hear the white horse beginning to hoof the soft golden streets of heaven. We can hear him snort. We can see his tail rising up as you put your feet near and upon that horse as you mount it, Jesus. The Bible says that you will return on a white horse. What a beautiful figure, a champion's horse, the victor's horse, the king's horse. And no wonder you have written on your thigh a name, king of kings and lord of lords. And we want people to bow now before they're forced to bow then, O oh God. Humble the proud. Humble the pompous pride of humanity. May we bow with a towel and a bowl of water and wash people's feet just like you did, Jesus. May your name, the name above all names, resound throughout the earth. We love you, Lord. And we pray tonight that you would continue to be the solid rock upon which we stand now and forevermore through Christ. Amen. And with that, let's stand and sing hymn 404, The Solid Rock.
As you find your, your pew tonight, would you please find your Bible as well and turn in the good book to Genesis, or excuse me, Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. title of this evening's message is Jesus Speaks to Churches That Are Lukewarm. And so we want to explore this tonight. And let me begin with verse 14, chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say... I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. O faithful and true Jesus, as you speak to us, your congregation, as you have to congregations for 2,000 years, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would hear your voice, that we would make necessary changes and if the shoe fits wear it we love you we pray this in your name amen lukewarm is a terrible place spiritually for a congregation and a christian to be A church or a person who is lukewarm in their faith is indifferent to Christ and the gospel. They are of little usefulness to the Lord in his service. They've lost joy, peace, and the pursuit of Christ. They are self-satisfied. They are self-sufficient. And this is what we have in the letter addressed to the Christians at Laodicea. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. There was a banking center in Laodicea, much affluence. When 
in 60 AD, there was a great earthquake. And the capital city of Rome said to Laodicea, we will help you rebuild. The Laodicean people said in response, no thank you. We have enough money to rebuild on our own. And so they were a self-sufficient city. And the Christians living in that city became self-sufficient as well. In other words, the people of Laodicea influenced the Christians more than the Christians influenced the people of Laodicea. When Jesus tells them in verse 19 to be zealous, he's saying there was no zeal in the church. No one was on fire for Christ. In fact, of the seven churches we are studying in the book of Revelation. Laodicea is the worst of the seven, spiritually, because this is the only church of the seven that Jesus does not find even one thing for which to commend them. There is no commendation here, as there has been for all the other churches. And so what does Jesus say? Listen to my counsel. Fight. Fight against lukewarm Christianity. Fight for your faith. Fight for your prayer life. Fight to read the scriptures. Fight to be at worship. Fight for the fellowship of the faith. Fight, fight, fight. Do everything in your power to fight against becoming a lukewarm Christian. Because the more lukewarm Christians there are in a congregation, the sooner that church will become lukewarm. And so what I'd like to do is take you through these verses and, and give you six ways to fight lukewarm Christianity. And I'll look at each of these six very briefly, but I want to give you background so you understand that Jesus is speaking into the Laodicean church, but also the culture, because the church had imbibed or absorbed the culture around them. And so there's no distinction, except perhaps on Sunday they showed up. And so let's learn how to fight against lukewarm faith. Number one, fight against lukewarm faith by looking at who Jesus Christ is. Verse 14, remember Jesus is introducing himself to each church with words appropriate to their situation. And this is no different. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Christ addresses them by telling them to look at the one they are called to serve and worship. And so friends, number one, Fight against lukewarm faith by looking at who Jesus Christ is. Look at whom we are called to serve and worship. Jesus calls himself the Amen. The Amen of Old Testament promises. The Amen of salvation. The Amen of hope. The Amen of joy. The one who is true and absolute in all his ways. I am the amen. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he calls himself the faithful and true witness. Oh, he was on earth. The one who is faithful to his calling, faithful to the Father's will, and true in everything he said and did. And then he says he's the beginning of God's creation. The word beginning there doesn't mean that Jesus was the first of many. It means the beginning cause, the first cause of creation. Jesus is saying, I am the origin of creation. There would be no creation if it were not for me. And now he says this, do you see who I am? How can you be lukewarm in light of the truth that I am your amen, your true witness in the beginning of creation? What a high privilege. Is there any higher privilege in all of existence 
than to love and serve and follow Jesus Christ, who is the amen, faithful and true witness in the beginning of God's creation. I know not one. Keep looking at who Jesus is to fight against lukewarm faith. Leonard Ravenhill, a pastor and evangelist, once said, the church has many organizers, but few agonizers. Many who pay, but few who pray. Many resters, but few wrestlers. Many who are enterprising, but few who are interceding. People who are not praying and praying. The secret of praying is praying in secret. A worldly Christian will stop praying, and a praying Christian will stop worldliness. Tithes may build a church, but tears will give it life. That is the difference between the modern church and the early church. In the matter of effective praying, never have so many left so much to so few. Brethren, let us pray, he says. Look at who Jesus is. You know, where are the agonizers in the church today? Where are the tears of grief over how the church is dwindling throughout the land and even in our own congregations? We need praying people. And if we're lukewarm, we won't pray. It is a prayer meeting, a sign of a congregation. Is church attendance the sign of lukewarm or red hot? congregations. Number two, we fight against lukewarm faith. We fight against it by looking at what Jesus thinks about lukewarm faith. It's one thing to look at who Jesus is. It's another thing to look at what Jesus thinks about lukewarm faith in verses 15 and 16. Now, these are classic words that you've heard before. Let's look at them briefly. I know your works you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. They were neither cold nor hot. They were lukewarm. And Jesus tells them, you are distasteful to me. You, you nauseate me. You see, the water that came from a city some miles away, was lukewarm when it arrived. And it had some calcium in it. And people who drank it would vomit. And Jesus is saying, your spiritual life is distasteful to me. It, it disgusts me. And I, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm water, have you ever tasted it? Have you ever poured milk? that is spoiled into a glass or a bowl of cereal and taking a drink or a scoop of your cereal? Yuck! Curdled milk, spoiled milk. In other words, Jesus wants us to be cold and hot. Now, let me help you understand this for a moment. A lot of people think that cold is bad and you got to be on fire for the Lord. That's not what he's saying here. Hot water was piped to Laodicea from the city of Hierapolis about six miles away. When this hot water arrived, it was lukewarm. But they could use it for the spas. And it had some medicinal value as people soaked in it. But it wasn't drinking water because it would cause nausea and vomiting. Laodicea did not have any natural water source, no cold water whatsoever. And so that water had to be brought in from Colossae when it was brought in. And that cold water from Colossae was pure, drinkable, healthy. But Laodicea had their no, no source of, of water for, the, for their city. And what Jesus is saying is... Cold is life-giving and refreshing and thirst-quenching. 
Hot water is healing and medicinal. And he's saying, I wish you were either cold and giving life and refreshment to others, or hot and bringing spiritual healing and well-being to others. But you are neither cold nor hot. You are lukewarm. Your ministry as a church is ineffective. You're not giving life refreshing, cool, river of life, vitality to anybody. Nor are you bringing spiritual healing to the sick and to the hurting. Laodicea, fight against your lukewarm faith by understanding what I think about it. Jesus reveals his mind tonight to Christians and churches that are simply lukewarm, sitting on their hands, no longer proclaiming the gospel. Lukewarm faith disappoints Jesus. Lukewarm faith threatens our usefulness. Lukewarm faith is dangerous because at the end of the day, am I really saved or not? We'll get to that in a moment. Consider Christ's cross. Look at what he did upon that cross for you. And let that revive your spiritual vitality as you consider his sufferings and his sacrifice and his hell-bearing and enduring for you. Number three, fight against lukewarm faith congregation by looking at who Jesus is, by looking at what Jesus thinks about lukewarm faith. And thirdly, by looking at how self-deceived we can be at how self-deceived we can be, verse 17. Notice their deception. Laodiceans, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You see, the Christians were as wealthy as the citizens, and they were resting on their wealth. They were resting on their bank account. They counted their money more than they counted Bible verses. And Jesus says, you, you say I'm rich, I've prospered, I've accomplished this, and I need nothing, self-sufficient, not realizing, here he goes, that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. This is how Jesus views them. How deceived can churchgoers be? How deceived can a congregation be? Many, if not most, of the people in the Laodicean church professed faith in Jesus Christ, but now we're beginning to sense that some who professed faith were not genuine Christians. Those words, poor, blind, naked, pitiable, wretched, can be used to describe a believer who's backslidden, and lukewarm, but they can also be used to describe someone who has false faith. And I say to you tonight, fight against lukewarm faith by looking at how self-deceived we can be. We cannot deny this reality about ourselves, and I say to you, test, test your Christian experience by the Word of God. Let the Scriptures define Christianity, not culture, we can be self-deceived and say, oh, I'm fine. How often have we said, oh, I'm fine? What you want is a discontent about your spiritual life. You're not there yet. You're alive. Your heart is beating because God wants you to grow more, share more, give more, sacrifice more, experience more, suffer more, praise more, worship more until he's ready to call you home. He's getting you ready. And, and while you live, live ready. Not lukewarm in faith, prayer, fellowship, and worship. Fight this with all your might. And what happens over time, and we've all experienced this in some measure or another, we become self-sufficient Christians. We become smug. We become prideful. It reminds me of the story in Pilgrim's Progress of two little children, one called Passion and one called Patience. Passion was the older child. Patience was the younger child. And Passion, as the story unfolds, was the one who couldn't wait to have all his good things in this life. 
Well, his younger brother, Patience, could. And Patience realized that the best was yet to come. And as the wonderful telling of this story unfolds, at the end of all things, passion lost everything worldly. Everything that passion had placed his hopes on was gone. And patience got everything. Because patience stored up his treasures, not on earth, but in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And so what Jesus is saying here is test your life by scripture, not by feelings necessarily, but by why the word of God says. Number four, fight against lukewarm faith by looking at what Jesus Christ offers. Now we come into the tender mercies of our Lord, into the love of Jesus, into the grace of Jesus toward his church. Verse 18, and so I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Buy gold, buy white garments, buy, buy salve. What is Jesus saying here? Well, let me give you some thoughts. All of these beautiful spiritual truths he purchased when he died on the cross. He lived a righteous life. He purchased our salvation and all its benefits. And now he offers a free, free, free salvation. Remember in Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come, buy, drink, and eat. Gold. Gold represents the gold that was in the tabernacle and the temple of God. Gold represents the, the streets of gold. Gold represents the holiness of God. Gold represents the holiness that God works in the heart of a believer. Gold represents the, the temple of God, the, the worship of God we will enjoy forever and ever. God is holy. He wants us to be holy as he is holy. And he's saying to the Laodiceans, come to me for the gold, for the holiness you need in life, because you can find it nowhere else. Then you will be true rich. Do you know that? That a holy life, a life of righteousness and obedience to the Lord according to Scripture is a rich life. And sin and unrighteousness is not only a sick life, but a very poor, impoverished life. That's what Jesus is saying. Come to me and buy the life that you were made to have as a professing Christian, a holy life. Notice what else he says. White garments. Buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Now, in this rich city of Laodicea, there is a beautiful wool industry. And this beautiful soft wool that was produced in Laodicea was used to, to bring together beautiful garments. And Jesus is alluding to the wool industry at Laodicea. And he's saying, come and buy white garments. What is this? What is the white garment that only Jesus Christ can manufacture? What is the white garment that only he can stitch as the master stitcher? Well, it certainly is not the fig leaves of our own making as Adam and Eve found out. No, the white garment that Jesus Christ has prepared for every Christian is the perfect righteousness of his life. The righteousness that is ours by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It represents our purity before the Lord. It represents our acceptance before the Lord. A white garment is not sullied with dirt. It's not sullied with, with corruption or oil or grease or anything. It's white. And Jesus has the power to make any sullied human being white. In fact, our desires can become whiter and whiter as we grow in our faith so that we no longer long for the sin we once loved. And we flee from it till we get to the point where we say, God, I hate this sin in my heart. Help me to crucify it. 
We live in a generation where, pe where pe people are worshiping their desires. They're worshiping their feelings. And whatever I feel must be right and true, where that goes against the whole texture of the Bible. Do not trust your heart. It will mislead you. The heart is deceitful above all things, says Jeremiah, and beyond any cure except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So buy the white garment. Fight against lukewarm faith, friends, by looking at what Jesus Christ offers us, the gold of his eternal holy kingdom, the white garment of his perfect righteousness, and the salve to give us eyesight. Now, there was a, a medical school in Laodicea. And they specialized in ophthalmology and eye diseases. So Jesus is, again, using another cultural understanding of the city. And he's saying, it doesn't matter, in one sense, whether you can see with your eyes or not. I want you to come to me, the true physician of, of spiritual sight. You need the salve of the Holy Spirit, the salve of spiritual enlightenment, that you might truly see what I want you to see. Would you rather see the sunset and sunrise with your physical eyes, or would you rather see the king of glory forever in your spiritual vision? That's what Jesus is asking. Ask him for gold and the white garment and the salve, and will you take him up on his offer? That's the question before you tonight. These are, these are things that are found nowhere else but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fifth, Fight against lukewarm faith by looking at how much Jesus Christ loves his church. Now, the, the, the bowels of compassion, the splanknas in the Greek, the, the overflowing of his compassion now comes through in 19 and 20. Those whom I love, I love this church. I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, here it is. I stand at the door. At the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. In other words, the Lord is pouring out his heart to this church whose, whose light is about to go out for good. And he's saying, I love you. Do you hear me knocking? Open up that we might fellowship again with each other and your light might again blaze for my glory. You'll notice that he says in verse 19, I reprove my people. I'm sure you've experienced the reproval of Jesus before. He chastises, he disciplines, because I love you. I mean, what parent would not discipline their children? What parent would not enforce the rules that the parents lay down and let their child do anything they want? That's not love. Children, sooner or later, discover that the discipline of their parents is one of the greatest signs of their love for them, along with the love of the parents for each other, which the kids pick up on. Oh, how Christ loves his church. And Christ sees our spiritual state tonight as nobody else can. And I say to you, fight against lukewarm faith by looking at how much Jesus Christ loves his church. I mean, his love is zealous enough to discipline us and to call us to repent. And if, if you need to repent tonight of lukewarm faith in all its dimensions, you, you, you've neglected your prayer life, you've neglected Bible reading, you've been watching way too much television, you've been spending way too much time on your hobbies, you have left off guarding your lusts and letting your, your natural proclivity to sin run its course. You're not repenting. You're living with sin. You're not confessing. Tonight, Christ offers you this. Repent. Be zealous and repent. Why? Well, look. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. You know, Jesus stands patiently at the door of your heart tonight, knocking. And we can look at this in three different ways. First of all, Jesus is knocking at the door of congregations. 
Jesus was left outside the congregation of Laodicea. Oh, the people were there, and they did their music and their fellowship and their coffee time, but Jesus was outside. And as he says to Laodicea, he says to many congregations today, many are closing their doors all the time, and they don't hear. Jesus is standing outside. Are you going to let me in? Are you going to let me in? I'm knocking. I'm knocking. Are you going to let me in? Jesus knocks on the doors of congregational hearts. Jesus knocks at the door of the heart of an individual believer as well, you and me, when we're straying from him, when we're sinning, when we're not living as we should, when a husband's not loving his wife as he should, or a wife's not loving her husband as she should. Jesus knocks at the door of our heart. When we're lazy, he knocks. When we're indifferent to him, he knocks. When we're using swear words or cuss words, he knocks. When we're viewing what we shouldn't view, he knocks. I'm here. I want to be let in. Let me have the... It doesn't mean he's not in your heart as a Christian. It means he wants the fellowship. I'll come into you and you with me will eat, will dine, will sup together and enjoy each other's company. And thirdly, Jesus knocks at the door of the heart of the lost sinner and says, I want to come into your life. Will you receive me? Will you let me come into your heart? And so, this is an invitation to open fellowship. When Jesus uses words like eat together, he's talking about fellowship. He's talking, I want to be in fellowship with you. And as a professing believer or a full or Christian, mature in your faith, you know what it's like that when, when you're not confessing that sin right away, all of a sudden, as David says, the joy of the Lord begins to leave me. And sometimes God seems far away. But when we live in sin, God intentionally withdraws a sense of his presence so that we might go longing after him again. In other words, Jesus is probably alluding to the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. Let me share this with you. The Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 through 3. This may be where Jesus is coming from. She, the bride, says this. I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. And says, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. So she said, I put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved has his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. And you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is knocking on your heart's door tonight. He wants to show you the love that only he can give you. He wants you to know the, the tantalizing beauty of fellowship with Christ. The spiritual fellowship that, is, that is, there's nothing like it on earth. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. We're reading the Song of Solomon as a, as a type of the church as the bride and Christ as the bridegroom. Number six, fight, friends, fight. Oh, fight with all your might. A lukewarm faith, a lukewarm Christianity, a whole hum indifference by looking at what Jesus Christ promises his conquering people, verses 21 and 22. Jesus goes on now as he does at the end of every letter and as we come to the end of the seventh one. The one who conquers. Is that you tonight? Will you be a conqueror? He says, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know how to fight against lukewarm Christianity? The best way to fight against lukewarm faith is to realize what Jesus Christ promises you as a conqueror. 
that you will sit with him on his throne forever. That's a figure of speech to say you will be victorious at Christ's side for all eternity, forever. And he's saying at the end, do you hear this? Do you hear what the Spirit is saying? In other words, how can I live a lukewarm Christian life and stay there when my beloved is calling me forward to sit with him forever on his throne? Victorious over Satan, victorious over sin, victorious over disease, victorious over death, paradise forever. Let us run the race, brothers and sisters, to the end. Doesn't matter how young or old you are. You say, I can't run, Pastor Mike. I need a walker. I can't hear well. My hearing aid isn't working. It's all spiritual. You can be 95 and run your heart out for Jesus, can't you? You can be single, widowed, lonely, and run your heart out for Jesus. You can be on a hospital bed and run your heart all the way to Jesus. Because it's spiritual. And so this is how Jesus wants lukewarm faith, lukewarm congregations to fight against lukewarm living. Will we? Will you? I think the overtures of Jesus here are the most beautiful music you could ever hear. Like a love poem, like a sonnet. See it as a, a love letter to your heart tonight. And before you go to bed, fellowship with him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you teach us, you teach us how we can become cold and hot, life-giving and life-healing in our own soul and for others. Oh, to be like thee, that is our prayer. Would you continue that process in our lives tonight? And if you're going to begin it in anyone's heart tonight, Lord, may you grant the gift of salvation and spiritual sight that you died on the cross for their sin and rose from the grave on the third day. We love you and praise you. In your name alone we pray, amen. Oh, to be likely. Let's stand and worship together. <clears throat>
here. The Lord will bless us. We love you, Lord. We give you our heart tonight. We've been singing about you, hearing you speak to us. Now may your people go in peace. And over Isle Reformed Church, go in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit who can revive and refresh and renew and lead us to be zealous for our Lord as we are or again. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.